Cool. Hello, and thank you for joining us in our first of our series of talks focused on pollinators on this beautiful fall evening. I'd like to take this opportunity to briefly describe how this webinar fits into the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. So if you didn't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that is completely independent from National Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission in connecting people to nature, researching and conserving species in peril, managing 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for habitat and recreation, and advocating for sound environmental policy in the New Hampshire State Legislature. I am here today because of our donors and members that support us. I would like to thank the following private trusts for their specific support of this webinar series and the educational initiatives in the Pollinator Gardens. That's the Cogswell Benevolent Trust, the Benjamin Couch Trust, and the Gertrude Couch Trust. We also have a huge network of over 2,000 volunteers that assist us with wildlife monitoring, ambassador, ambassador animal care, environmental education, and of course the garden and sanctuary management throughout the state. If you are a volunteer, member, or supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, thank you. If you would like to become a member, volunteer, or supporter, please check out our website for ways to get involved. Um, the next thing that I have up is a Zoom uh, Help 101. Um, I'm sure this isn't anyone's first Zoom, but as um, a review, um, to mute yourself, the button is on the lower left. Um, to start and stop your videos on the, the button right next to it. Um, the two ways to ask a question tonight is by raising your blue hand. And by raising your hand, you just click on this participant's uh, bar and you click this button over here that says raise hand. Or at any time um, during the presentation, go ahead and open up the chat, just like y'all did uh, just a little bit earlier and um, type in your question. And uh, Heidi has some, some times between sections of the presentation that she can um, address those questions. And then we'll also have a, a full Q&A session at the end of the, uh, the presentation. So, and now I'd like to turn it over to the series organizer, Diane DeLuca. Diane has been a senior biologist with New Hampshire Audubon for over 30 years and has many roles here, including playing a pivotal role in the restoration of breeding terns along the New Hampshire seacoast. As with all careers, hers has morphed along the way. She now pioneers the organization's efforts to establish and educate others about the importance of pollinators, as well as leading many phenology and wildlife monitoring projects around the state. In her current role, she manages all the activities in the McLean Demonstration Garden for pollinators, including the vol vast volunteer effort it takes to maintain the beautiful garden. She has also organized this speaker series to bring you some of the region's experts. Without further ado, here's Diane. Um, thanks, Mark. And I'd like to just take a moment to thank Mark for making this webinar possible with his expertise in getting everybody online and a very cheerful face for New Hampshire Audubon. Um, so I live in an area with poor connectivity. And there are many silver linings to living in the middle of a large piece of protected land, but connectivity is not one of them. So I am a face on the screen here, but we don't have enough uh, connectivity to actually have audio. So that's why I'm very thankful to Mark um, for making this happen. And thanks also to Heidi for her willingness to share her deep knowledge of butterflies in New Hampshire. And we are very grateful. So by way of introduction for Heidi, Heidi Holman is a wildlife diversity biologist at the New Hampshire Fish and Game Department's Non-Game and Endangered Wildlife Program. For the last 16 years, Heidi has been assisting with habitat management and the release of captive bred animals and the recovery of species such as the Carner Blue Butterfly and the New England Cottontail. Heidi enjoys working with public and private partners to protect the biodiversity of the Granite State and develop strategies to keep common species common as identified in the Wildlife Action Plan. So we are 
very pleased to have Heidi with us tonight. And um, I'll turn it over to Heidi. So thanks again, both to Mark and Heidi. Sorry about that. I couldn't find my unmute button. <laughs> There's always challenges. So Mark, can you hear me? I sure can. Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So um, I'm really excited to be here tonight and I'm glad that there are so many people interested in butterflies of New Hampshire. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what I know about butterflies broadly get into detail of some of the projects we've been doing over the past few decades and the types of conservation actions that we can take for some of those that are most at risk, and then lead into some of the broader actions and ways that we can work together in the future to ensure that we maintain the diversity of this group uh, across time. So uh, there are a variety of butterflies out there. I'm sure you've seen them if you do gardening, uh, depending on the diversity of plants that are present in your gardens, may determine what types of species you've seen or how many different locations you go to. So my quick question for everyone is, how many species of butterflies do you think there are in New Hampshire? You can take a quick moment and put that in the chat. Butterflies and moths or just butterflies? Just butterflies. Very good question. <laughs> oh, wow. So we've got 40, 85, 60, 30, but someone here, wow, has an amazingly close and accurate number of 139. Wow, impressive. So our friends at New Hampshire Audubon actually uh, put together a compilation of people who had been doing this type of work uh, monitoring butterflies across the state and they came up with a total of about 130 butterflies that are expected in the state. So 139, good job Anandi. So let me just try to get rid of my chat box here. I didn't think that one through. I will not use the chat box again. <laughs> so threats to butterflies across the state. This is what we've compiled from all of the information in the Wildlife Action Plan. Um, commonly development and loss of habitat, also fragmentation of that remaining habitat, their primary drivers for declines, pesticides through direct mortality from insecticides or loss of their host plants from herbicides, Climate change has many unknown uh, impacts onto all of the species, disease, invasive plants, recreation, and agriculture. So there's many things that each of these species face. So a little bit of 101 again on butterfly biology. They all go through four life stages, the egg, larva, chrysalis, and adult. The length of time that any individual spends in a life stage can vary. 
uh, risks, all of those risks that we just looked at, how they impact each species differs depending on some general characteristics. So the number of plants that a butterfly can eat as a caterpillar, the number of times they go through this life cycle in a year. So some species may only have one generation of egg larva adult in a year. Some may have two to three or more, and some may even take two years. How they overwinter, um, which life stage they overwinter in. So the corner blue butterfly overwinters as an egg. Um, some other species that we'll talk about overwinter as larva and chrysalis, which is that pupa. And a few rare individuals actually overwinter as an adult. So just a quick example of how one of those particular threats can interact with these characteristics of each species. So this is from a research paper that was compiled in the early 2000s about European butterflies. And they were specifically looking at how does climate change impact a species depending on the size of its population. Um, so this example is similar to our eastern-tailed uh, blue, which is a very common species, and there's many of them um, in a given area. They have a large geographic range, multiple generations, they eat a variety of plants, so they're not limited. And because they live across such a broad region of Europe, which is depicted by the orange in the map in the middle, uh, that they have a lot of tolerance for spring and fall thaws and winter temperatures. Um, so by 2080, they predicted the map on the far right of the screen. They predicted that the occupied core of the middle would maintain, that the changes in the environment wouldn't impact the ability of the butterfly to live there. To the south in the gray area, you can see that was a range reduction. So the butterfly lost all of that area it had previously occupied. And then to the north, you see the red on the map and that shows where the butterfly actually expanded its range. Again, this is all theoretical. So this species that has large numbers and broad tolerances and multiple plants can adapt very well. And so they predicted it would have no net loss uh, in the face of climate change. Compare that with a species that's similar to our Carner blue butterfly. Um, this particular species, they indicated, had a small population size, a small range, which is the orange area in the middle map, limited generations per year, limited host plants, and a very narrow environmental tolerance um, based on the fact that it lives in such a northern climate. And there's probably details there I'm leaving out, but you can see by 2080, there were only a few sparse patches left. So again, this is just to demonstrate how one particular threat can impact a species based on all of these life history characteristics. So at that point, um, I might open it up for any questions in the chat before I go on. And I would just ask Diane if you could monitor it for me uh, because I don't want to get it stuck on my screen again. Heidi, we had one um, from, uh, I think, Justin. Um, and he's interested in why there are so few painted and American ladies. Oh, well, I'm not aware that they're limited or that they're undergoing any significant declines across their range. What I can say anecdotally is that when I began some work in the White Mountains in 2017, I saw a very large number of them up um, on the ridge line, which surprised me and, and all along um, the lower elevation as well. And I haven't seen them in those numbers since. And so I'm thinking it's more of a cyclical 
thing. Insects tend to be very cyclical, um, have boom and bust years. And also um, the painted lady and the American lady have some migratory capacity. I use that loosely because it's not as consistent as the monarch is, but it can be more migratory over time up and down um, latitudes from what I understand. So I wouldn't be convinced that it's a permanent decline, but maybe just a, a downward trend in a cycle. Thank you. Yeah, th th this year I've seen probably only 5% of what I saw over the last three years. I've actually designed my whole gardens around host plants for those species and things like that. And they, this year they just didn't show up. And it's been, uh, I've spoken to several other people that also uh, uh, have butterfly gardens and things like that. It's the, the same thing, they're just missing. Um, Heidi, there are a couple other questions, but I might just jump in on Justin. At the pollinator garden this year, we had a very short window where we did have painted ladies, but I would agree with you. Usually the window is much wider and it seemed to be just a few days where we actually saw them there. And, you know, I'm just thinking back to last year since our pollinator garden at Audubon is two years old now. And last year we had a much wider window where we saw them spending time in the garden. So, um, Heidi, a couple other questions. Are butterflies considered to be an insect? And um, the second question you're probably going to get to, and how is the Carnar Blue doing in Concord? So I'm guessing you're gonna speak more directly to that one. Absolutely, we, we will get into that in just a minute. And yes, um, butterflies are an insect. So they are in, uh, they're called Lepidoptera. They're joined with moths uh, in their own sort of group. But yes, they are an insect. So, all right. Well, there'll be time for more questions as we go through and, and maybe as we get in deeper to specific butterflies and, and their life histories and things that we know about them, um, it'll stir your thoughts on more things you've seen so you can share with me, like the painted ladies. So I just wanted to dive into how Fish and Game um, has the ability to um, look at conserving species. And we've only been able to begin with some of the most rare and threatened uh, species that exist in the state. So the first one, of course, is the Carner Blue Butterfly that many people have been familiar with. Uh, the Nature Conservancy began some of the initial work in the late 80s and early 90s as the species was going through declines across its entire range. It was listed as federally endangered in 1994 and efforts continued uh, to protect land and work with land Owner degraded and disappearing for so long that we actually lost the species from the state in the year 2000. Luckily, at that time, uh, partners from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the New Hampshire Army National Guard, the Department of um, Resources and Economic Development, which is now DCNR, and Fish and Game, we all came to the table with the city of Concord and uh, New Hampshire DOT representing FAA and we could jump to action right away and, and start to re recover the species. So just a quick note, I always like to point out uh, the, the butterfly in the larger photo is an eastern tail blue and you can see it only has two little orange dots and some tails hanging off its hind wing. The small butterfly in the insert is a female Carner Blue butterfly. And it's very easy to see the difference when they're side by side that the Carner Blue butterfly has orange dots all the way up the hind wing. And the reason I say this one is a female is typically the females also have orange dots all the way up the forewing as well on the outside. So just a quick note, if you're keeping your eyes open uh, that the eastern tail blue is often out there. 
Blue Butterfly uh, had a historic range that extended all the way out to the Midwest and that's depicted in the yellow. And in 1994, when they declared it a, a federally endangered species, they developed a recovery plan which identified units where conservation efforts would be undertaken to recover the species to hopefully delist it someday. And that included the only place in New England here in Concord, New Hampshire. It was the last remaining place in, at the time uh, for the species in New England. Here in New England, Carner blue butterflies have always been associated with pine barrens, whereas in the Midwest, they're associated with an oak savanna. One thing that's similar about these systems is they have a very sandy soil and that's what drives the whole ecosystem and, and this whole natural community that's very unique. Um, that sandy soil is very dry and it creates very low relative humidities that lead to the potential for burning because it dries out all of the vegetation. And so that burn interval is much shorter than say a forest in the White Mountains, which they suspect burns every 300 years typically. So here in the Pine Barrens, it's expected that if naturally was allowed to burn, it would burn every five to 10 years potentially. So that burning creates these openings that you can see that those black areas exposes sandy soil uh, and it selects plants that are adapted to live here and that includes some things like scrub oak um, which has oil in its leaves that also perpetuates burning uh, pitch pine trees which have really thick bark which protect them when fire comes through and doesn't girdle the tree it allows them to survive um, there's resin in those needles that also promote fire uh, some of the lower vegetation. There's lots of blueberry, which has oils that like to burn. Uh, there's little blue stem grass, uh, which is a native clump grass, and it's adapted to survive because it has roots that are up to five feet deep underground. So even as the fire goes across, there's so much of the plant underground, it can survive and then it can capitalize on that flush of nutrients that comes from all of the burned material releasing nitrogen into the soil. And then of course, our most dominant and important character is the wild lupin. Um, that is the only plant that the caterpillars eat for the Carner Blue Butterfly, and it requires these sandy fire adapted communities for it to persist. And so it was over time as development occurred and fire suppression occurred and canopies and dense trees started to form, it shaded out the lupin and that's when the Carner Blue started to disappear. Luckily, we had secured with all of these partners with the conservation agreement, the ability to restore habitat for the species. We used all kinds of techniques, heavy mechanical equipment, herbicides, prescribed fire, and planting with hundreds of kids from Concord um, to restore lupin and increase the amount of habitat around the Concord airport. We then also started captive rearing to reintroduce the butterfly. As we said, it was extirpated, which means it completely disappeared from the state in the year 2000. But luckily we were able to collect some eggs from New York, uh, the closest population, and begin raising them and releasing them year after year to restart this new habitat. So for the past 20 years, we've been releasing butterflies and monitoring the habitat to adaptively manage it uh, over time to prescribe if we should keep releasing large number of butterflies, small numbers of butterflies, when to come in and mow an area again, when to come through with fire. And since 2005, which is roughly the year I started and we had enough butterflies to actually do a population estimate, we've seen a positive trajectory of growth. And as 
I mentioned before in response to Justin's comment, um, insects can be very cyclical. They're sensitive to environmental uh, variables in any given year. Uh, there can be outbreaks of competitive pests or things. And so you can see that there's been fluctuation over time, but the general trend has been reaching that 3,000 butterflies, which is our recovery goal. Uh, so since 2016, we've hit that number for three out of four years, and I have yet to do the data for this year, but I suspect things may be good. So um, we have shown success up to the federal uh, recovery goal, but are uncertain that given this type of fluctuation, that will be enough to maintain the species over time. So we'll continue to evaluate that. Uh, but one thing to note, this success has come with, we were releasing thousands of butterflies a year in the early 2000 to 2011 window, but over the last um, five to 10 years, we release anywhere from 50 to 300 or 500 butterflies a year. So a lot less, uh, and we're still seeing that population growth. So we, we feel pretty good. So during the time we've been doing this work for carnivore butterflies, um, we also were doing good work for the frosted elfin, or so we hope. The frosted elfin is a state endangered butterfly that also lives in Pine Barrens, and it eats the same wild lupin as a caterpillar that the carnivore butterfly does. So it's the only habitat it can use. And so we've been monitoring that population since we started recovery actions to make sure we weren't having a negative impact on this species. Just recently, the Fish and Wildlife Service has listed the frosted elfin as an at-risk species, and it's been added to their work list to be evaluated for federal protection. So in 2017, a species status assessment was compiled across the range of the species, and that's depicted in the map. You can see each of the individual known populations. There's about 400 of them across the range, one being here in, in Concord, New Hampshire, uh, that they, eat a variety of host plants, either the wild lupin or in the southern part of the range, the wild indigo, which is Baptisia. And they also have um, numerous populations that they don't even know what the host plant is. They realized by compiling the species status assessment that out of the 400 or so known records of the population, information was only known on about 20% of them. So here in Concord, we, as I said, had been monitoring it for a while. So we had the opportunity to share our knowledge um, that we had gained through working with the Carner Blue. Uh, just one thing to note, they have only one generation per year, which is really interesting to me because they seem to have optimized their life cycle. They are a very early spring, uh, butterfly and so they eat the lupin early early on before it actually sets seed and I th think this gives them an advantage for a higher reproductive rate and when we had them in captivity and we were collecting eggs from the female we could actually start to document that that may be the case. Um, so I, I say this is the fact that even though the habitat had declined and the Carner Blue Butterfly had been extirpated, the Frosted Elfin never disappeared from Concord. So it seemed to have something that gave it a little bit more tolerance. So following the species status assessment, uh, we received a grant from Fish and wildlife, the results that we could collect in our captive rearing lab. Uh, we developed protocols to raise large numbers of the species uh, in case other populations across the range needed assistance. 
And um, surprisingly, the most difficult thing with this particular species is they don't like to mate in captivity. So we actually had to design a new technique where we released individuals, let them mate in the wild and went back and found them a week later and then collected their eggs. And it was surprisingly effective. And uh, we were able to collect hundreds of eggs from a very small amount of individuals. Um, another thing that we did was take another data point with mark recapture and distance sampling. And we documented that over 10 years from 2008 to 2018, when we were managing for corner blue butterflies, we actually doubled or potentially tripled the population of frosted elephants at Concord. So just by doing rotational burning and mowing at a very um, conservative scale and at different times to protect all species and, and not to impact any particular species, we did see uh, this population benefit. Um, so we were able to share that information as well. Working in this very unique system, and you can see the trend and that there's unique plants and then there's unique butterflies that depend on these plants. Again, if you only have one food that you eat, that really limits your resources. So another lupin specialist is the Perseus dusky wing. Uh, the Perseus dusky wing was in Concord. Uh, the last record was several decades ago. Um, over the time that we've been working broad butterflies uh, through periodic walks and every three to four years in the beginning of the restoration, uh, we were trying to demonstrate that we weren't having an impact or losing large uh, amounts of diversity by our rotational management. Unfortunately, we've never documented the Perseus dusky wing skipper. Um, this may be that it had some very unique uh, aspect where the conservation effort could begin, it had already disappeared. Um, and so this is one of these cautionary tales. We'll be out there looking for it and anyone who wants to go out there and, and look for it as well, uh, I'd, I'd love to see your photos. Um, you can see that one of the telltale traits is this line of white dots uh, along the wings. But I've heard that can be inconsistent and um, often we have to rely on experts. But um, another particular species out there though that we have interest in that is still present um, and we look to start some work in the near future is the Edwards hair streak. Uh, so Edwards hair streak eats um, hard, uh, small oak species and so in our particular pine barrens that's going to be scrub oak. Out in the Midwest that would be a, a black oak type of species. Uh, but what's so interesting about the Edwards hair streak is that they have this relationship with ants. So a lot of hair streaks and the carners and, and that whole um, group of butterflies, they often benefit from ants that tend them to protect them from parasitic wasps and other ants or things that may want to predate them as a caterpillar. But these particular individuals actually go into the nest at the base of scrub oak that ants create during their later larval instars and then come out and feed nocturnally at night. So it's a very unique relationship. And in many cases in Maine and in places in Massachusetts where there are pine barrens that have scrub oak, over 90% of the scrub oak is not occupied by this species. And my guess is it might have to do with this relationship with ants. And so it's something in Concord, we know we have some strong populations in a few of our patches, and we want to make sure that we protect that. Um, so far, what we're doing is work, but we, we don't want to, to miss anything. So before I move on to the Arctic tundra of the mountains, um, are there any questions about some of our Pine Barren specialists?
Lady, I see a few questions up here. Um, people are definitely enjoying your presentation. Um, advice for growing native lupin is one question. Unfortunately, the jurisdiction for that plant it rely, it lies with Natural Heritage Bureau. It's actually a protected species because it's so rare. And they're very um, cautious about that seed moving between counties. So I'm restricted to only use seed from Merrimack County. Um, so it's, it's something that we don't have a lot of opportunity to expand outside of the conservation effort. Um, here's an interesting question. Will this year's drought affect the Carner Blue? That, yes, that is a very good question. So based on our monitoring data this year, the raw numbers show that there was no impact and we wouldn't have necessarily expected it. Uh, it could have maybe killed some of the chrysalis between the first and second brood if it was super dry, but likely we'll see a decline next year because they had lower reproduction. So the lupin was looking pretty dry by mid to late June and that second generation of caterpillars was feeding on it in early July. So my guess is those females that flew late in the summer laid much fewer eggs. That's really interesting. So um, here's a question. Do butterflies occasionally adapt via natural selection perhaps to be able to increase the number of host plants they can use? Yes, and we're going to get into that story right now. Okay, and then there's um, one more question about does the spring azure look like the Carner Blue? I have several pictures of the azure, none have the orange at the tip. That's exactly right. There's no orange in, in the spring azure on the external wing, and there's also a summer azure. So they're just blue. There's a silvery blue also. So when their wings are closed, there's no orange present. So there are a number of questions here about um, gardens. And I don't know if you want to take these now in specific species or if you want to wait until the end. And talk Let's a wait bit. until the end a little bit because we're going to go into broad pollinators. And um, if that's OK. Yeah, that sounds like that would work very well. OK, great. So, um, you know, we've been working hard in the Pine Barrens, which is one of our more rare ecosystems here in New Hampshire. It's very limited to Concord and, and some locations up in the Ossipee area, but there are different species located in both those places. Uh, now we're gonna go into the, the Alpine environment, which is another very rare and, and limited habitat present in the state of New Hampshire. And in 2017, we began our work with the White Mountain Fritillary, which is a state endangered species. Um, one that also is being looked at by our partners at US Fish and Wildlife Service um, to be considered for federal listing. So the White Mountain Fritillary is what we call endemic. That means that it only lives in New Hampshire. It's a subspecies of a uh, Arctic butterfly that came down during the glaciation period and as the glaciers retreated, it left some populations on the top of mountains in Colorado and Oregon and here in New Hampshire. And over time, they became isolated and um, their own sort of separate subspecies. Uh, they have one brood, we think, every other year. It's possible some individuals may complete their life cycle in one year if the timing is just right. It overwinters its first uh, winter as a, a first instar caterpillar. That means a freshly hatched caterpillar out of an egg that has only maybe eaten its eggshell and nothing else. So it's a very, very fragile little caterpillar. Uh, the second year, it overwinters as a late instar caterpillar. Um, so slightly hardier, but still um, s sensitive to environmental conditions. 
Uh, it's been associated with snowbank communities, and that was based on some work from Vermont Center of Eco Studies. They did some population surveys in the early 2000s and um, really got a handle on where the species was located. Um, but we haven't known what its host plan is, so it's hard to actually know what its critical habitat is. Again, I just like to point out that just like birds, butterflies have a lot of similar lookalikes, and, and I, there's quite a few species of fritillaries that are present in the state of New Hampshire. Most of them are in low elevation, so you may see them around your home. Uh, they eat violets, so that's a pretty common species that's kicking around. Um, but you can see that the wing patterns are all different. Uh, a lot of the more common fritillaries have spots versus the white mountain fritillary in the bottom left has um, more variation of lines and zigzags and, and spotted patterns. So I mentioned that fritillaries in general eat violets and this is just common for them, this entire genus um, all across North America and in Europe, it's just violets is their, their plant of choice. But unfortunately, um, when they got left on some of these tundra mountaintops, violet wasn't necessarily the most common plant that remained. And this is true here in New Hampshire in the presidential range. Uh, there's a few different violet species that are possible, but they're in very limited numbers and it just doesn't seem likely to support the population that's up there. Uh, work has been done on other species across North America to investigate what it is they eat because they notice the same phenomenon. And in some locations, they found that they ate different willow species or they started eating vacciniums, so relatives of the blueberries. Uh, in some cases, they switched to something in the rose family, uh, which would be interesting in the presidential range. We do have this unique mountain avens that lives only up there. Uh, and the buckwheat family is also common, but the alpine bestor in the presidential range isn't very common. So it doesn't seem like a likely switch. But um, as someone asked earlier, insects have very quick generation cycles and do have the ability to adapt over time um, with such a thing as host plant selection. And sometimes they may actually have been polyphagous, so they may have eaten multiple plants uh, at any given time during this transition or maybe before, and that leads to that adaptability to threats and changes over time. So we started this project to figure out what that plant is, because we know that climate change has a possible influence on the species over time. Um, they live in snowbank communities, and as the climate warms, there may be less snow, and that could, play, that could change the type of vegetation that's present. Uh, recreation, there's a lot of backcountry skiing activity. Um, I know this year, due to COVID, the hiking was very um, busy. And there were a lot of new people out there and a lot of off trail activity was occurring, which could impact the species. Um, and then we also have found um, common pests of blueberry species up there and seen some um, ravenous feeding on some of the vacciniums. And if that was the host plant for the caterpillar of the white mountain fritillary, then we could see there could be some competition and, it's uncertain if this pest species is taking hold and would spread even further with a changing climate. There's just so many uncertainties. But overall, it comes back to, we need to know what the host plan is to start to mitigate for any of these threats. Um, so since 2017, we've been working to establish a captive colony and we've been successful in collecting eggs and hatching caterpillars and getting them to survive to the point of feeding them host plants, which you can see a caterpillar with at least eight different species being offered to it. Um, but unfortunately, we haven't seen them actually eat and digest any material to date. So 
our buffet isn't quite right and we're gonna keep working on it, uh, but it's very slow progress. It takes a year for us to collect the eggs, have the caterpillars over winter and try to feed in the spring. And in order to have the least amount of impact, um, we only want to hold them in captivity for a few days instead of letting them die. So we may actually go out and um, release the caterpillars and try to track them in this upcoming year. So stay tuned. Um, we performed a second data point of two years of population surveys and we'll be analyzing the data. So there was a population estimate done in 2012 and 13 that estimated the population to be about 1,500 individuals. So our raw data looks somewhat similar to the results they had, but until we run the estimate, uh, we won't know if we're witnessing any sort of decline uh, in the species. Next year, we'll also begin um, doing genetic work so we'll be collecting um, tissues from individuals across the various peaks to look at connectivity. So we don't know if um, butterflies from Franklin uh, actually intermix with butterflies from Monroe or if the butterflies from Monroe have any connectivity to the butterflies in Mount Jefferson. So we don't know how many individual subpopulations there are across the range and if some of those uh, patches are isolated and are at risk themselves. So by collecting the DNA, we'll be able to assess how much um, dispersal is occurring. Um, we'll also hopefully do some mark recapture work to actually document dispersal length and activity of individuals. Um, and then we're going to continue to work with our partners from um, the U.S. Forest Service and the Appalachian Mountain Club, the Mount Washington Observatory. They've all been great um, and, and we'll stay on educating the public um, as we see expanded use. So while we're up there, just like with the, the pine barrens and, and having other species around and we're gonna make the most of our work and, and the time and the people. And um, there's actually another species that is endemic to the White Mountains. Uh, it's called the White Mountain Arctic. And this particular butterfly actually lives more in the sedge uh, grassy openings along the, the Arctic um, alpine zone. And so, there was some substantial work done on the species about five to 10 years ago by a PhD student. And she did try to do a mark recapture survey, but unfortunately couldn't recapture very many. And so we don't have a good population estimate, but we do have raw numbers that we'll try to design a new survey that will index with those numbers in the upcoming year. Um, also, uh, we'll take a look at probably how many eggs the females lay, certain parts of the captive process to get indices on their life history traits, um, hatch success, things of that nature, um, while we, we figure out you know, what the trend for the overall population is. And through that preliminary work, we may identify if there are other threats beyond climate change or the recreation, um, and we may identify other actions. But uh, both of these species, again, are, are part of a, a federal work plan with our partners, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so together with these surveys and, and research over the next few years, we'll do a species status assessment for both species uh, in, a, in about four years. Um, I think I'm just going to keep going for a little bit, Diane, just in the sake of time. Sounds perfect. Okay. So we've talked about some of our more rare species that live in rare, unique habitats, um, but I also wanted to touch on the monarch butterfly. There's been a lot of conversation about monarchs and a lot of questions about what's going on. They, they are being considered for federal listing. And so I just wanted to share a little bit of the information uh, I work with the Monarch Joint Venture and partners across the range on um, trying to bring back information on the species and 
and actions that we can take here in the Northeast. So what makes the monarch so unique is that it migrates like a bird. It is the only species that consistently migrates like a bird in a given year uh, and has done so as part of its life process. And it, that makes it known to everyone across the country. Uh, it, it is just a gem uh, of, of North America. So the monarch butterfly has four generations in a year typically. It can have up to five in some cases, but four is more likely. Uh, and so we'll just walk through it real quickly. Like right now, they are about to overwinter. Uh, um, they're gonna overwinter as an adult and all of the butterflies overwinter east of the Rocky Mountains, all of the butterflies overwinter in one mountain range in Mexico. Fascinating. All of the butterflies that you see east of the Rocky Mountains fly down and overwinter in one mountain range in Mexico. Those butterflies are going to be there until about March, and then when the light and the temperature triggers them, the, those butterflies are going to fly up to Arkansas and Oklahoma, that southern tier of the U.S. They're going to breed, lay eggs, and then they'll die. So these butterflies didn't breed. They went into a reproductive dormancy. They overwinter in Mexico, wake up, lay their eggs, and they're done. Those caterpillars hatch and they grow on milkweeds and then they start to fly further north. And this happens again and again. Eventually they're in Canada. Um, we see them here in late summer, uh, going through their entire life cycle. And so usually by August and in September, we're at that fourth generation of monarch butterflies. And that's the generation that goes into a reproductive dormancy and we see migrating down along the coast. Um, the peak date of migration for New Hampshire is typically September 12th, but I, I know everyone's been noticing it's, it's a little bit later. Um, so this is a fascinating cycle. Um, you'll see on the map there is a western population that goes up and down the coast of Oregon, Washington, and California. And there's a little bit of overlap, but not much. They, they really are somewhat distinct. So how do you count a, a butterfly that lives in all of these places? And there's so many of them. And the fact that they do overwinter in this mountain range in Mexico that has the perfect conditions for them, um, they have a way to estimate how many butterflies and they've been counting them since the early 90s. The way they do it is they've averaged how many butterflies are in one hectare or one acre of these OML forests, these specific fir tree forests at an elevation of eight to 12,000 feet. And when they estimate how many acres of trees are occupied, they get a population size. Um, so since they started counting up until about 2014, they saw a 90% decline in the species. And that was around the time they were petitioned for federal listing because things were getting really dire. Um, at that time, people started coming together and looking at what do we do for the species. So when you look at actions, you got to look at the threats. And this shows there are so many threats that are causing the declines in monarch butterflies. You know, there's diseases and pathogens that come from some, sometimes the captive rearing of them and release for commercial purposes, um, the loss of overwintering habitat, the loss of milkweed in the Midwest, the loss of milkweed here in the Northeast, herbicide use, lack of nectar plants, climate change. I mean, they live in three different countries and all along this migration route, there's so many different obstacles. It could be the wrong winter conditions or hurricanes on the migration route, um, just so many. But they do believe that probably the primary driver is the loss of habitat or the amount of milkweed for the species. Again, these are just some images of um, butterflies that had died during overwintering, um, a loss of the OML forests in the mountains of Mexico. 
So partners came together and wrote, um, it's called the Mid-America Conservation Strategy, but it does include the Northeast and an appendix. Uh, and it's, it's the plan of what do we do? How do we um, make sure that the monarch butterfly doesn't disappear or the migration doesn't disappear? And so what came out of it, um, all hands on deck, was a, a paper that rallies a lot of the scientists together. And basically it says we need to make 1.3 billion stems of milkweed to get the population up to the size that we think it will persist over time. And that's um, 1.3 billion stems of milkweed. How do you do that? So they divided it into four different sectors, um, agriculture, rights of way, which includes roads and utility corridors, urban and education, um, so cities and, and then edu educating people, uh, and public lands, so forest service, wildlife management areas, uh, anything, town, municipal lands. So here in New Hampshire, uh, we started working with the New Hampshire DOT uh, about a year ago to develop a plan that met the criteria for uh, a candidate conservation agreement uh, to protect the species in the case that it is listed, but to facilitate um, work to occur along rights of way. Uh, so what we did is we went out and we did a baseline monitoring of sections of road and documented nectar plants from May to September and documented how many milkweed and looked for monarchs that were present. So now we're taking this representative sample of roadsides in New Hampshire and developing a plan that we'll bring to New Hampshire DOT for their approval. Um, the plan will have recommendations for modified mowing, uh, potentially seeding, um, integrated pest management if there were invasive plants, um, and then again, targeting areas for more intensive um, demonstration sites. We've also partnered um, with New Hampshire Audubon, our friends, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Project Learning Tree on the Schoolyard Action Grant Program. And so every year, uh, about 10 schools are awarded um, funding to create habitat for wildlife on their um, grounds, and then they can use that for in-place education. And so each year, there's been an increasing number of pollinator gardens that have come into the application pool. Uh, and now we're specifically targeting also historic projects to make sure that they include milkweed and things for monarchs. Our goal is to get um, all of these schoolyards registered as monarch way stations, um, and also maybe expand to other town properties. Um, and then in addition, our partners at the USDA have been actively going out and working with agricultural producers here in the state. So they've covered um, pollinator plantings, especially along orchards and um, along other areas to help with the crops, but also um, in this mission for monarch butterflies and, and a few other uh, bumblebees. So um, I just wanted to bring this all to a point that, you know, we're talking about some of our rare species and what we can do to conserve them. But we said there's 130 species of butterflies. And I barely mentioned about seven tonight that we have actively been able to start working partnerships um, out there to do protection. And we know that there's been a documented decline of 90% biomass loss of insects in some parts of the world over the past 50 to 100 years. So what that means is when you're in your car and you no longer have to turn on your windshield wipers to clean the window, they call it the windshield wiper effect, um, there's just not as many insects out there. So that's not only the monarch or the corner blue, it's a lot of our other common species. And this is important to us because they're indicators of ecosystem health. We've been talking about them in pine barrens and in the alpine zone and how the degradation of those areas or loss 
of habitat and changes to the plant communities results in the loss of our butterflies. And so there are indicators of, of changes and other things that could occur. And so this brings me to the final points of um, just looking at pollinators broadly and, and why Diane has everyone here over the next few weeks. And um, our best approach in, in keeping our common species common is to take actions for the group as a whole. Uh, and, and, you know, we have 200 species of bees in New England, all kinds of different bees over 4,000 species of moths in New Hampshire alone. Um, and that was according to Don Chandler, he was guessing, so it may even be more. Uh, and there's numbers of flies and ants and beetles. There's just so many things that aren't even as pretty and beautiful and easy to identify as butterflies that are suffering from some of these uh, declines and, and we just can't even document. It. So some of the actions, uh, just as a take home, creating habitat, um, pollinator gardens. I know Vicki Brown will be talking about what you can do next week um, on your property and, and how to be a good steward, similar to you know, how we manage the Pine Barrens. Um, one of the key pieces is to have that diversity of vegetation. Uh, this is a list that's from UNH Cooperative Extension showing flowering times of plants from May to October. So it's critical, especially for bees and, and other insects that need pollen and nectar, that there's always something flowering on the landscape. The most simplest thing is just to stop mowing and see what comes up. Um, you may have some native diversity that's just in your field or in the edges of your lawn. Uh, if you manage broad fields and do want to mow, um, there are certain windows, you know, before May 1st or after October 1st are great for all species. If you're trying to avoid um, impacts to monarchs, um, you can mow in the middle of the summer and the milkweed can regenerate uh, when they're actually completing those later uh, life cycles here in New Hampshire. Uh, we were talking at the start um, about how exposed sand is so critical for so many of our bee species and just having native bunch grasses instead of some of your um, cool season grasses somewhere on your property like the ones that are normally in your yard that's naturally going to create some exposed sand um, you can do bee houses you can leave um, dead woody stems kicking around a lot of our other native bees like to use those be judicious with your insecticides and pesticides. Ask about your plants and help create demand for pesticide-free plants here in New Hampshire. I think that's something we can all work on together. Um, but definitely, uh, it sounds like everyone is out there with their eyes and I'm curious to hear what other questions we're gonna talk about, but participate in citizen science. Um, for monarchs in particular, there's Journey North and also the Monarch Watch tagging program. Um, and ideally in the future, I'd like to see us have a broad archive of all butterfly species in New Hampshire. Um, one potential program we might get up and running is to get more, um, North American Butterfly Association point counts going in the state. I have been working with um, a wonderful educator who's developed an entire curriculum to teach people the butterflies of New Hampshire. And uh, we were hoping to get it out this year, but given COVID, we're a little delayed. So do stay tuned for that as well. And with that, I'm gonna wrap up uh, for any questions. Thanks, Heidi. That was really wonderful. So there are a few questions in the chat, but at this point, if people want to raise their hands and ask the questions themselves, that's um, that would be great. But let me throw out a couple that are here. Um, there were some questions about gardens in general and particular species, but maybe I'll ask this question first. Can you speak to the size of a butterfly's territory? Does each one differ? It seems butterflies stay in the same part of a meadow or wooded area. Very good question. So 
with carners, we know that their typical movement is 100 to 300 meters. That's like most, like 90% of what they do. So you can imagine that 100 to 300 meters, um, not very far. They can travel up to a kilometer or two kilometers, but that's like a good wind or something is just making that individual go. Um, so that can vary based on the species. And I don't know a lot of distances for many, but that's exactly what we're going to be looking at for the White Mountain Fritillary. Uh, if their typical movement is even less than the Carner Blue, then they will be very distinct isolated populations. If they can travel as far and, and maybe further, then, then I think the entire mountain range is connected. So that is a critical piece. And then obviously monarch butterflies have a range of, of thousands of miles, even in that last generation. Um, but frosted elfin is very territorial as well as other hair streak butterflies, especially males. So you'll see them circling the same patch. That's great. So there are a couple of questions about gardens and specific plants. Um, do you have recommendations? Sorry, I'm getting my connection is unstable, even though I'm not even using audio, audio but or video. But anyway, do you have recommendations on creating a pollinator garden and a rain garden combined? I would love to learn more, especially since both applications are typically separate. I wish I could answer that better. Uh, my guess is, you know, it, it would have to do with the types of plants you selected. And so in one edge, the rain garden edge, you could put things um, like bone set or um, uh, Joe Pieweed that are more water um, adapted. And then as you transitioned into more of a pollinator, um, garden area, things that like a little bit drier soil. So I, again, my recommendation though is diversity and flowering over the broadest amount of time. Um, um, someone asked, is New Jersey tea a necessary plant? So New Jersey tea is actually one of the few nectar plants that is around during the second brood of Carner Blue Butterflies. It's, it's actually very depauperate in the Pine Barrens and I think in New Hampshire in general, um, the amount of nectar that's out there in some cases naturally. And so it does fill a very critical role. Um, another one is Meadowsweet Spirea, which can be found in disturbed areas and doesn't mind the droughty conditions as well. So this is an interesting question. Someone asked, is black swallowwort a significant problem for monarchs or will it become one? It can be. Um, so it's closely related to the milkweed family that monarch butterflies can be attracted to it to lay their eggs. The chemical signature or cue that would normally trigger them to identify it as a good spot um, kicks in, but unfortunately the caterpillars can't complete their life cycle on it. So it can be a sink. I, I'm not familiar with the distribution, but I'm hearing that it's more widely spread than I thought. I know we have targeted it in some of our wildlife management areas where we have a lot of milkweed um, specifically to minimize impacts. I would recommend if you have the opportunity to get rid of it. Um, there are a couple of questions about the best resources for New Hampshire's butterflies and moths. Well, identification. Uh, there's a lot of 
general books. I personally like Butterflies Through Binoculars uh, for the Northeast. That, that's my go-to book. I use it all the time. It's got great pictures. Um, but, you know, there's also uh, Warren Keel's book, right, that is The Butterflies of the White Mountains that talks a little bit about species in the, the northern part of the state. It's kind of a neat read. Um, Kaufman's also, uh, any general guide is good. Um, I would, again, like to see us continue to build more resources that are very specific to New Hampshire uh, together. That would be great. I have a question. Sure. That's a question. Um, so I actually, um, I grew up in Concord, but I live in Boston. And last year I saw so many monarch butterflies, more than I have seen in years. Um, but this year I've seen very few. And um, the other thing is, is I wondered how the overwintering habitat in Mexico is doing. Um, I'd, I'd heard some, you know, pretty bad news about the cartels coming in and doing some illegal logging um, in part to plant avocados. Um, and also as you know, many people probably heard that one of the biggest advocates for the monarch um, in Mexico was murdered um, by um, uh, people in the cartels, they, they suspect. Yeah, it's obviously very, different um, in the overwintering part of the range. And a lot of work has been done as part of the conservation effort to partner with people in Mexico and provide support um, for the ecotourism. They established the UNESCO site. Um, there's a long history of biotourism, but we know that um, things have been very tumultuous in the area over the last decade or two because of the cartels. Last year was the first year I started hearing some losses in the, the good partnership and, and some impacts to the overwintering, but I haven't heard anything definitive that, you know, it was to the point it, it was the reason we may have seen less this year. So that that's not my understanding. And I was just on the phone with, um, some people from the Monarch Joint Venture today, and it, it wasn't part of the conversation. But um, I did heard the same story and also noticed myself this summer that there was a significant difference in the number of butterflies that were observed. Last year was a banner year. We did see that the number of hectares increased last winter uh, to you know, the, the level that they hoped for. The butterflies are just starting to arrive in Mexico now. They usually get there about the first week of November and in larger numbers, and I'm not sure. Um, so uh, again, insects are so variable and it's such a large species that the only trend data that we can rely on right now is that overwintering count. Also, the listing decision for the species is due in December. So if you're interested, um, that is when I would expect an announcement from Fish and Wildlife Service with detailed information justifying um, whether or not the species deserved federal listing. Thank you. There are a couple other questions. Um, will the White Mountain Fertilary Facebook page return next year? So we had an amazing researcher, Samantha Derenbacher, who was so enthusiastic. Um, she started that page, also uh, Twitter and Instagram. I believe we can take those keys if, if we know that it is um, something people are looking for. I, I know one of her fellow colleagues did take over the fritillary finders on Instagram. So I'll check up on, on the Facebook page. 
And one other question here. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of native plants? Absolutely. Um, so as we saw with some of the rare species, they are dependent on one particular host plant. Um, but we said there's 130 different butterflies. And so each of them eats something different. Some may eat a few different things, grasses, New Jersey tea is actually the host plant for a, a rare moth, um, which we didn't even get into those. So our broad stroke is a diversity of habitat. So in this case, the diversity of plants supports a diversity of wildlife. And the more that you provide, then the more we're ensuring that we're less likely to kick someone out or leave them out of, of the buffet you're offering. Um, so I, I would just say native has so much value, including your weeds, because um, you never know whose home it is. I, kind of along those lines, if I can jump in. Um, I started a couple of years ago a group called the uh, Portsmouth Caterpillar Club. Uh, oh. it, it's uh, for people on the seacoast, and it's about people that are interested and native plants that are host plants for different species of moths and butterflies. It's kind of fun. It's not all Portsmouth. It's really just had to come up with a name and that's what came to me at the time. And then I know Vicki Brown also has a group, the Pollinator Pathways in New Hampshire. That's also a great source of information and ask um, uh, questions about those things. I'm definitely interested in your Caterpillar Club. I would love to connect and hear about it. I know I have met Vicki and Pollinator Pathways, Evie, uh, and um, you know, they, they're fantastic. And I've been hoping to, to see that continue to grow. Um, there's so much to offer. Um, with the people who are still on, I just want to invite you again to the two additional pollinary, pollinator um, webinars that are coming up. Vicki Brown's going to do one on Thursday, October 29th at 7 o'clock of Extension. Is going to talk about gardening in a changing climate. Um, and she is actually the climate adaptation ma manager for UNH Cooperative Extension. So we invite you to join us again. And thanks again for all joining us tonight. And a big thank you to Heidi and to Mark for making this happen.